guys, welcome to the game plan. Hope everyone's doing wonderfully well. Here I am in a new studio, and again, guys, my goal here is to give you guys the best I can offer, and the coolest, frankly. Part of this is that I wanna be a kid again, and so I get this, this nice studio with lots of toys in it, and you guys will see more and more toys as we continue to advance in this game plan. So, uh, first off, amazing game last night. For those of you that stayed up to finish watching it, uh, obviously on the East Coast here, it was pretty late, but without further delay, let's get right into the charts, all right? So, again, Number one, let's take a look here, guys, as we go into the keys from the day, right? So if we flip over to the charts, and just bear with me as I get up what I need here, we're going to look at the morning blast. Now, the morning blast here, we have a couple key things that I want to talk about. Number one, the S&P 500, we know on Friday it closed above the $5,000 level or 5,000 point level. All right, the key is it's trying to build on that momentum. Generally, when you pierce even numbers, you get a certain amount of time where there can be a reversal. In other words, can you actually have a fake out of a breakout or is it a real breakout? And the key to that is looking and seeing how long it's able to maintain that $5,000 level. So if it maintains it generally for three to five days, that would be very bullish, meaning it's consolidating above such a key level. All right, so again, that's what I'm looking for this week. Now, we do have some big economic data this week. We've got to understand, we got CPI, we got PPI, we have other economic metrics, including Federal Reserve speeches throughout the course of the week that could throw a wrench in the plans for the market to continue to go higher. Are we overbought? Yes. Is the breath weakening? Yes. We're going to cover a lot of these type of things, in fact, just in this next statement right here. Now, this is a very important one for me, guys. So if we just take a look at this, it says the rally has narrow support despite the numbers. 39% of the S&P 500 companies are below their 50 moving average. All right, so think about that. You have a market that's at all-time highs, but just under 50% of the companies in the S&P are not only down, but, but basically below their 50 moving average. All right, so again, that's really, really important to understand here. Number two, at the beginning of the year, 91% were above their 50 moving average. So what does that mean? It tells us basically that the breadth is becoming narrower and narrower in the markets. All right. In other words, there are a few stocks, namely semiconductors, namely Microsoft and a few of the other magnificent six or seven that are leading the stock market higher. But this is something as a technician that you pay really close attention to because it's telling you that, again, the market internals are breaking down and we have to be ready for a reversal. Once these mag seven or, or even six, if you want to exclude Tesla, once they stop leading the market, this market will have a corrective move. Now, how big of a corrective move? That's up in the air, right? I mean, we don't really know. Is it going to be a small correction of five to 10%? Is it going to be something bigger? We'll have to watch and see. But this again is epic. Like to again, to think that the markets are where they are and 39% of the S&P, which is, by the way, I think it's like 185 stocks or something like that, are below their 50 moving average. That is not something that is healthy. All right, a couple other things here on the charts as we continue through. If we continue, guys, going on, we can see that a couple other tidbits we have. Um, again, let me break, bring that here. We see that Jeff Bezos announced that he sold 12 million shares of Amazon, basically $2 billion. We also have NYCB hoping to ride Friday 17% rally into the new week. Again, that saw some little bit of insider buying, not enough to get me excited. I still am very conservative. I discussed last week, again, how I got caught up in the Silicon Valley bank failure, and I learned a lesson there, right? Even at my level of career, you have to understand you're still learning, you're still continuing to be aware of pit falls that you could get caught in, right? So again, just to go through that, in my first years when Silicon Valley Bank failed, I probably would have put a ton of money in it. That was a lesson that I learned back then. You know, we're talking 20 plus years ago. Then as I advanced in my career, even more recently with Silicon Valley Bank and some of these other banks that failed about a year ago, you know, I was still kind of inching into them, but I was putting like 2% of portfolio, 3% of portfolio, very limited, and I still got burned. And so now I'm at a point where I'm like, at this stage of my career, do I even want to mess around? 
For me, no. Now, some of you guys may be more risk um, okay, right? You might say, oh, I'm okay taking the risk because I could make 50 or 100%. That's totally up to you. I'm just letting you know where I am at my stage of the career. All right, lastly, guys, Fed speakers today, Bowman, Barkin, and Kashkari. So, again, we'll see what they say overall, how things go forward. All right, let's get to the charts. All right, so number one, I want to start on the S&P 500. The main thing on this chart, when we're looking at this chart, right, so if we take a look at where we are, we can see the run that we have had. Historically, guys, this is one of the strongest market rallies that we have seen. Now, I say strong in terms of price momentum, not breadth, right? We know that the advanced decline list is very, very weak. More stocks are hitting 52-week lows than 52-week highs in general, as well as, as I discussed, where are a majority of stocks trading below their 50? Well, not a majority, but almost 40% trading below their 50 moving average. But in terms of price action, this has been an incredible rally. Historically, we're now at 15 out of 15 weeks. 14 weeks have been up, and the markets, again, are a powerhouse. It's drawing more and more money globally. I think, obviously, the problems in China are continuing to be something where it's drawing money from China into the U.S., which continues to catapult the market up. Now, again, the biggest thing here, so, again, you could look at trend lines, right? You have, you have a trend line right below here. Let me put that in right now as we go through. Let's take a look. So you have generally you have a trend line right here. This is the trend line that I'm watching that I'm paying attention to. All right. So again, let me step back so you can see it here on the charts. So here's your S&P. This is going back to the October lows of last year, not October of 2022 when we made a, that major pivot low. But again, notice how you basically hit this low here. Right. We go right through here and we go right through here. This is my warning line. And what I mean by is this, as long as the S&P stays above here, there's really nothing that the markets, like you don't need to be concerned as an investor. The markets can continue to grind up. However, if you violate and start closing below this area on the S&P, that then would be something that you would start to be very aware of, right? You'd say, okay, now we are in a warning territory. I wouldn't call it a breakdown of epic proportions, but it would be a short-term breakdown. Okay, so that's something to watch. The other thing just to keep in mind, guys, you do have negative divergences here. And what I mean by that, guys, is if we look at this high here on the S&P, it coordinates with that high there on the RSI. What we can see is as we've climbed higher, this high coordinates with this high, which is lower than there, right? And then what we do is as we hit this high, we're now even lower on the RSI. So again, you have a declining RSI versus an inclining price. And for those of us that are technicians, what do we know that means? It means that the breadth again is weakening. It means there's distribution. Distribution, a key term. For those of you that don't know, distribution basically means that you have a scenario where big money is starting to slowly unload. The strength in the rally is due to lighter volume and retail buyers, but it's not necessarily big institutions. So it's just, again, another warning sign, which again, it doesn't take a genius to know that the markets are overbought. We are there, but it's looking for the signs, looking for the reverse pivots to let us know that things are at a point where it could get messy. Looking at the NASDAQ 100 here, folks, again, we are up into a key level of resistance here on the NASDAQ. We know the NASDAQ has been the leader, right? Percentage-wise, gain-wise, strength-wise, it is pretty remarkable. But one thing you should note here, so number one, you still have the negative divergence, right? Right down here, right? Clear as day, negative divergence as price has gone up. But you can see this wedge pattern is starting to condense and it's going to get to a point where same thing you don't need to be worried about the nasdaq 100 until or when it violates this area down here you get below that that's where you could see the bigger correction take hold all right the only other thing i think is important to mention is that if you actually go to the nasdaq composite let's look up the nasdaq composite here all right everyone thinks all oh, markets are at all-time highs right but if you look at the nasdaq composite and we go to the weekly chart the NASDAQ composite is not at a new all-time high, right? We're close, but we have not gotten there, all right? So let's bring that chart up right now. Here's your NASDAQ composite. And again, the NASDAQ is a broader index versus the NASDAQ 100, which is just those top tech 100 companies. And so again, the reason I bring this up is just to make you aware that again, the 100 within the NASDAQ, that includes the Magnificent 7, it's much more condensed versus the NASDAQ which again, we can see is not at a new all time high just yet. And it definitely is lagging what we're seeing in the NASDAQ 100. 
Okay, let's continue on here quickly, guys. Let's go to the 10-year the ten -year yield. The 10-year yield, this is the same area that I've discussed in previous videos, right? So we've talked about this, you know, kind of widening megaphone type pattern, which is ki giving us a range of the 10-year right here is resistance, right here is support. In general, I would anticipate there still could be a little bit of a pop maybe to this area right up here, 1.37, 1.4. But by the way, this is no doubt a bearish overall longer term trend, right? So you can have something like this where it goes up and down and up and down, but eventually you would anticipate this breaks down. The only way this breaks down, folks, is if the economy weakens, which again is gonna be something we watch for in the coming weeks and months, okay? And again, CPI data. I mean, imagine, think about this, guys. There's, if the CPI data on Wednesday, if we get that, and I believe it's on Wednesday, it might be Tuesday, but I believe Wednesday, if that does not show additional downside or at least price stability, like if price surprises and starts to inch up a little bit, that would be a catastrophic issue for the markets because, again, the markets tend to extrapolate out three to six months. And so if, if you start to see an uptick in prices, the market starts to think, uh-oh, what if we continue to go up and up and up over the next few months? How is the Fed going to actually cut rates? And all of a sudden, you have a change in potential narrative. So something to really watch. I'm really watching the CPI and the PPI data this week as it comes out in a few days. Taking a look at the U.S. dollar here, let's take a look at the dollar. The dollar, again, clear as day. We have the pivot high right up here. And again, as we just kind of draw that down here to here, and we're just basically into resistance. Again, you have this meteoric move up on the bigger time frame, and then a lot of sideways chop. You have a pretty clear area of support right down here as well, right around 101.50. I still think eventually the dollar declines, and there's a longer term trend line around 96 to 95. That's where I believe the dollar will head, probably six to 12 months out, though. Well, maybe not. Maybe just six, six to 12. Well, yeah, six to 12. We'll go with that for the time being. Okay. A couple other things to go over here on the chart as we continue on. I do want to take a look at a few different um, big players out there. We have a very clear area on Apple. Now, you could argue that Apple, even though it's still one of the biggest companies, the second biggest company uh, publicly traded here, we do see that it is, again, same thing, a narrowing uh, wedge pattern. So what we're watching for on this is over the next few months, does it break above here or does it break above here? This will ultimately dictate which direction it has a big move. If it's able to break through this upper range, you can actually get a significant move to the upside. But same thing here. If it breaks this area, which is around 182, 181 now, and confirms you're looking at significant downside on Apple. A couple other bigger names. I saw a request from Meta, so we'll talk about Meta here real quick. If we take a look at Meta's chart, all right, so we know that they had the amazing, well, it was good earnings. It surprised Wall Street. It was strong. They announced a massive buyback. They announced a dividend. I think the compilation of that really surprised Wall Street with how good the earnings were after just really a year ago or so. We know, you know, Zuckerberg was like, hey, we're going to spend so much money on the metaverse. It's going to crush our earnings and all these things. And they kind of did a 180, right? All of a sudden, we're back to huge profitability and an inclining type of situation. But if you're looking for a max move on this, let's take a look at this, right? Let's take a look at our weekly chart. We have a trend line that, again, goes back to 2018. And this line is kind of where I'm starting to isolate down where Meta might put in an ultimate top for a longer period of time. And that's right around the $500 even number. So just keep in mind, we're trading at 468 or so. There's no guarantees it gets to 500, but that would coincide with this area right up here, thereabouts, right in that vicinity. And that, to me, would be a major long-term high. By the way, I do want to show one thing here. If we look at this bigger time frame, I remember looking back at this. So I want to switch back to the NASDAQ. This is something I didn't want to forget with you guys. So in fact, let's go back to the NASDAQ 100 here. Let's flip over to that. All right, so here's your NASDAQ 100 monthly chart. And we talk about major resistance lines. And what I want to show you here is, so here's your dot-com bubble. By the way, 
I don't know how many of you guys are my age or, or older, but the dot-com bubble was an epic collapse. I mean, we watched as companies that had no business having valuations where they were collapse and basically go to zero. Even Amazon dropped 90 plus percent before obviously the epic run that it's had and, and been built into that company. But what I want us to do is let's take that high connected through this high, and I wanna show you this trend line as well. And this is again, a level where you have to start wondering, is this going to come into play? Look at that. So again, you take your dot-com high, and this is rare to be able to find a trend line going back this far that's actually being uh, hit, but look at that. Look at this move here, and look at what we are hitting basically at this point. Now, you could pierce this, right? I mean, there's always pierces, but when you have a trend line going back this far, if you're a better, if you're someone who plays probabilities and you see how extended things are, and by the way, look at the negative divergence on the monthly, right? We look at this high from 2022 right there. Look at this, higher high on the Qs, way lower on the RSI. So there's, again, this is the weakening. This is telling us that the weakening, this even though we're hitting new all-time highs on the Qs, the underlying fundamentals, the, the, the reality of the situation is actually weakening here with this negative divergence. So just keep that on your radar there as well. All right, a couple of the charts just to go over real quick. We can take a quick look at Google here before we flip into some commodities. And Google, again, guys, you can see it's slowly approach, approaching. And you can see, look at the channel. And look at where we topped out going into earnings. Look at the reversal. We came down to technical support, and now we're moving back. Now, if you're a technical trader, where are you shorting Google? And the answer is very simple here, right? We look at gap fill right here. We can draw, extend that out. That's your zone right there. So essentially, you're looking back at 152 as a shortable level on Google. That would be a gap fill. Remember, there's a lot of, and let me just explain why gaps work so well, why gap fills work so well as resistance. When you have a gap, okay, in fact, I'm going to draw this a little bit more clearly for you guys. Let's, uh, let's do that real quick. I want to just get this fully down for you guys because I think this is a key educational tidbit. So we're gonna bring the chart over here, creating a clean slate for me, just to do a little education. So let's say we have a gap here and the price opens down here. So it closed here and it opened down here. And before that, the chart was trading like this or it was trading up into that, either way. What ends up happening, why gap fills are so big in terms of resistance is that you have all the buyers that are buying up here, right? They're buying here, whichever way price. They're all, I mean, they're, remember, anytime volume trades, buyers are equal, meeting sellers. So there's a lot of people, if price is up here, the amount of shares that are being bought or sold, they have to be being bought by someone. So you have a lot of buyers that were accumulating here, and all of a sudden they wake up one day, let's say Google has earnings, and then the Google, Google stock is getting crushed. And so they're all like, oh my gosh, what the heck? And so as gap down occurs, they're in panic mode. They're saying, oh my gosh, I don't wanna dump, I don't wanna stop out because I don't wanna take the loss. As price moves back up, what do you think these people are gonna do when they get back to break even at gap fill? They're gonna say, you know what? That was a scary trade. I bought like two days before earnings thinking it was gonna be a great trade because of AI and all these other factors. But you know what? It turned out to not be. I'm now back to break even on my position. I'm gonna exit the position. And that creates selling pressure that can push it down. And that's why you look for gap fills to work. And so going back to Google, that would be something that you would expect it to, to basically occur at those levels. All right. On that note, guys, we're going to head back to center screen here. Let's jump back to the center. And I do just want to give you guys an update on the Lux Algo. So it's almost fully complete. Again, it's going to be an incredible indicator. I'm super excited to launch it. It's going to be launched only in about two months, but I'm going to also come out with four other indicators for Lux Algo. It's going to be in a suite for verified investing. And again, I will make those available in two months when they debut. They're amazing new. It's kind of like something that, that other players can come in and create their own indicators on Lux Algo. So let's take a 30 second break real quick and just say hi to Lux Algo, thank them. Have you considered enhancing your trading experience? We have an amazing tool for you. Lux Algo creates next gen trading indicators to help the world understand the markets in a smarter way. They have the largest user profile on TradingView and are the only official Discord partner in the technical analysis space. Lux Algo Premium operates seamlessly with top platforms such as TradingView and Discord, making it the perfect tool for every trader. Take your trading analysis to the next level with Lux Algo. Please visit the description below and sign up for Lux Algo today.
All right, back we are, guys. So right into the action here. Here's your Bitcoin chart. We've seen Bitcoin have this beautiful move up right basically back to what we would consider to be a double top, all right? So again, let's take a look right here as we go through and look at the technical level. So first off, as a technician, and right, you have to understand, so I'm neither short nor long Bitcoin right now, but honestly, I did put out a short last night above 50,000 in case it would trigger. It did not trigger. But I just want to give you guys a heads up that you still have to respect this can right here that's a topping tail candle until the daily closes above that that is not negated that is the dominant force in the charts so even with this great move up technically speaking this is still the dominant force in the chart all right now again one of the things to keep in mind here is that even with that you still have to flip over to your weekly chart and so you have a daily topping tail, but you also have a weekly topping tail. So again, this now becomes a key thing to look at on the weekly, which is basically that as long as you don't get a weekly close above that, that then is the dominant force as well on the weekly. So for me, when you talk about, okay, well, why did Gareth put out a short potentially above 50,000? And by the way, as price changes, if we consolidate here, then I'll cancel that out. Right now, I still have it live in the market. But again, if it does, if it, if it kind of stays here for a couple days, I'll probably cancel it. But the idea being is that you have to look at the weekly close, which isn't until obviously basically a week from now to see if that's negated. All right, so I'll be watching that very closely. I'm a firm believer that what we're seeing in crypto right now is a is essentially a liquidity pump. So you have massive amounts. And again, this is so weird for people to understand, but if you look at M2 money supply, M2 money supply is now starting to slightly incline, which again is more liquidity in the system. It creates risk on. You also have credit card debt, all these other debt forms that aren't included in M2 money supply, they're continuing to pop up. And that's creating a scenario where, again, it's risk on in the stock market. And that's now carrying into crypto in this late, latest move. So we'll keep an eye on that. A couple other things to look at quickly, guys. And again, I want to cover natural gas. But quickly on Ethereum, we talked about this level last week right here. Again, bubbled right up above that level. It's pulling back a little bit. If we can really establish ourselves above this 2,500, you have an upside to about 27 and change. But right now, it's struggling right at that technical level. One chart I want to show you guys is this one. I am short this one, TIA, which is, uh, I think, Celestia. The idea here is it's an upsloping trend line. I'm expecting a trend line break here. And look at the negative, the quad negative uh, divergence here. Lower, lower, lower. So high, higher, high, higher, high, higher, high. Low, high, lower, high, lower, high, lower, high. That's telling you there's distribution going on there. So just be aware on this Celestia, if it breaks this line right here, that's going to be trouble right there. All right. Couple other charts to go over. I do want to touch on gold, although there's not a whole lot going on here. We have a little downtick in gold today. There is a potential short term breakdown on gold going on. If this does break, you're looking at 1975 as your target zone right there, that pivot low on the chart on gold. All right. So again, let's get into a few things here as we get through. Let's get that rid of that. All right. And who knows what the heck I'm doing here. So we'll have to see on that. Look at that. I can draw cool things, though, at least. <laughs> All right. Um, let's see what else we got here. Uh, maybe we could see. Does that go back to it or this? Ah, you know what? Screw it. Come over here, guys. Follow me over to this one. This is why it's real live TV. This is what you have to do. All right. I want to show natural gas real quick. Let's look at natural gas here on the charts as we go through. Natural gas is an interesting one, guys. I have a major trend line here on the chart, and we did open sharply lower. Look at this. So we opened sharply lower, but look at this trend line coming through here, and we're now bubbling back above it. We're even above Friday's low. Friday's low was not a bottoming tail, but nonetheless, it is still potentially a reversal here off of this trend line. I haven't added more than what I added last week. So again, my dollar cost average is not a bad dollar cost average. And again, I'm still expecting a big move. Look at the positive divergence. I've talked a lot of negative divergences, but look at this. Low, lower low, low, higher low on that. All right, guys, I don't have, let's go back to center screen. I got to get going, honestly. We basically have to get going to the live trading room. I'm in the actual trading room. I almost want to throw this all the way to Dr. B or Ben, but I won't do it today. Not today, but you guys be where, where all right? Um, ah, what the heck? We'll do it right here to Canyon. Uh, you guys have a great rest of your day. Um, I'm hoping to bring you guys the best stuff. Thanks for watching. I'll talk to you soon.